Thank you very much for this panel. Very, uh, very thought-provoking set of presentations. Uh, several questions of my own. I know you do as well. Um, so um, let me start the ball rolling here a little bit. Um, Gail Schenker, you really had a terrific, clear presentation. Um, and I, uh, you know, who, when, what, how. And in your presentation, you talked really uh, kind of hinted at the relationship of informed consent to decision making, sort of upstream in the in the process. Uh, and I, I'm just uh, uh, prompted by the fact that uh, my wife and I are, are revising our wills because it's been a long time and the Congress has fiddled with the laws and uh, we're in a different state. And lawyers often introduce um, uh, you know, decision making with respect to preferences at the end of life in the, as part of the state planning processes. And if you look at a chain of event that starts when you're doing that kind of anticipatory planning versus when patients get a major issue uh, that's related to um, uh, uh, their health, like uh, developing, say, cancer or another chronic disease, and then you come down to uh, an event like a procedure, like uh, LVAD, uh, for example, if you have cardiovascular disease. seems like there's a way to disaggregate the decision-making and understanding your patients with respect to values and preferences rather than putting that all at the end when you're facing the implant of the LVAD, uh, when you're in a different situational state. And I wonder if we're really thinking about the relationship of these concepts and the systems uh, approach to to understanding our patients' needs and preferences, and then approaching them uh, with uh, trying to under, uh, decision making, and then using technology on the provider side to make that information available at the point of care. Have you guys thought about that? Yeah, definitely. And thank you for those um, comments. I, you know, I think, um, and this is something you know I've I've talked about offline with with some people here as well. Informed consent is often sort of the trigger that that gets doctors, anyways, uh, thinking about this. And in some ways, it's the stick because we sort of know we have to do that, and there are there are legal implications. Um, I think, and I would hope that we can also use it, and by by sort of thinking about it not just as the the signature on the form, but as the process, as as a way to help. Um, uh, promote some of this decision making earlier. And I think for many of these uh, procedures, we do have time in advance. It's not a sudden, the patient's here in the operating room, now is the time uh, to conduct the process. Certainly for LVADs, um, uh, you know, heart failure is a chronic uh, disease most often. Um, and we see these patients repeatedly in the hospital. We sort of don't think about bringing some of these things up until, um, you know, uh, the, the procedure is imminent, but I think the more that we can we can incorporate uh, uh, these conversations earlier, uh, the better. Uh, Kim, thank you all. Um, my question is for Dr. Goldkind. I was um, startled uh, by your statement that we are not interviewing individuals that drop out, and why and um, thought that that was a, a missed opportunity for learnings that could serve as the basis for future design. So I'm wondering, why is that? Are there rules, regulations that uh, limit those conversations and that ex uh, exploration? Uh, I'm not aware of any rules or regulations that would limit that conversation. I would think, as a matter of fact, that we would be encouraged um, as part of doing good research to have those conversations because I think that when patients are um, leave a clinical study in particular I'm you know my focus on is much more on biomedical research but this would be true for socio behavioral as well you lose valuable information you don't know why they're leaving you don't know whether it's because they're disgruntled with the with the study, whether they had uh, adverse events that uh, they're not reporting, whether they feel like they didn't get the benefits out of the research that they thought they were going to be getting. So from not only from understanding the informed consent process better should we be uh, getting that information, but if you want to be completely cynical about it, 
from the perspective of trying to meet the goals of the research, we should be getting that information because it gives us data on the efficacy and safety of the intervention that we're supposedly studying. So I think it's a, um, I, I would en encourage that. I would imagine that um, uh, there might be some in certain um, studies where that type of discussion is going on. But I think that there are likely some with, and most circumstances where it's not. Moreover, it takes effort because people tend to decline to stay in a study with their feet. They simply don't come back to the clinical setting. And so you then have to recontact them to understand why, why did you miss that appointment? Are you withdrawing from the research in toto? And there has, there's, a, there's a conversation with, that would actually have to occur. Uh, Katina? So in the first series of talks, I started thinking a lot about this question of community and how community studies are different. And it extends, as you're talking here, um, so much of what, what the bigger issues are being framed as um, is the risk level in biomedical studies is very different than community studies theoretically. But when you talk to community members like um, Dr. Quinn's group has done, you see that many times those community members feel the risk of what they're doing um, in the moment is as is, is significant as anything else um, that anybody else would do, even a surgery or other things. They feel like, um, you know, in HIV prevention, other areas of studies, even if you're not doing anything other than drawing their blood and asking questions, that's pretty significant. And so I just wondered, in the studies that you talked about earlier, um, Dr. Quinn, how were those framed? Were they framed um, as a biomedical or behavioral study? And how did people kind of think about whether it changes what they think is important and what they want to know, and how does that impact what we talked about earlier this morning? We actually, um, in our survey of the um, community members, um, African Americans and Latinos, mm -hmm. asked about whether they'd be willing to participate in a range of studies with different level of risk involved. So we ask, uh, we call, we call the scale "Do Take Give." So would you do a survey? Would you take part in a program? Would you give blood? Would you give a DNA sample? Would you take a medication? Would you take a medication by injection? Those kinds of things. And so we tried to look at it sort of across an array of risk levels. Um, and what we did see is that there was actually still surprising willingness to participate even as the level of risk, um, potential risk went up. What I think often is forgotten, particularly with racial and ethnic minority populations, is I think as researchers, dare I say it, that there may be some, and some of the literature bears this out, there's, a, there's some preconceived notions that people will not participate. And what we've seen is that there is willing to, willingness to participate across different risks and that the perceived benefits or the mode, I should say, the motivations really are if people have the disease, if somebody in the family has the disease, if they think it will help future generations, if it will help others. It's not financial incentives. It's not necessarily care. It's because I believe I can make a contribution somehow. So I think that um, we can begin to, and, and I go back to some of, of the discussion here, is that when we focus on risk, that we need to be careful that we don't make preconceived notions about what people are willing to do, number one. Number two, that I think we also have to talk about benefits. And the benefits may be not simply benefits to the individual, but benefits to the community or to a broader society. Sure, please add to that. So I wanted to just add my anecdotal comments to um, what Dr. Quinn said. I, I've had the, um, the privilege of being, of interfacing with disease-based foundations and groups in a number of, of settings where the research was high risk. And in some cases where it was very clear that the people who were going to be enrolled in the research were not going to be the beneficiaries of that 
immediate intervention. And what struck me in these conversations, and they were conversations that went beyond just the informed consent, but to get their input on what would, uh, would, you, would you be inclined to participate in the placebo-controlled trial? Would you be willing to forego treatment? Um, and circumstances where perhaps their disease would actually worsen, where they could not have, um, where those irreversible changes could not be ameliorated. And what struck me was how, um, how very engaged the, in, the groups were, how much, how, how much input there was in terms of the design, the informed consent process, the language used, the understanding of what risk levels they were willing to, to tolerate beyond what we actually expected they would. Um, and so I'm, I'm obviously making these comments from an anecdotal perspective. But I think that we should not underestimate the power of that kind of dialogue and how much benefit not only will we get from that kind of dialogue, but they will get from feeling that kind of um, exchange. Should we do that dialogue only when we've got something we want to offer them because we're doing research or because we've got a particular approach to a cure in a treatment situation? Or should we be asking those questions beforehand so that uh, we know how to approach our patients in the first place? Yes. Um, all those things. And I think that, that the, and there are ways that people do this. I mean, um, there's a literature on the use of community advisory boards that really were um, um, initiated largely around HIV clinical trials and mandated by uh, NIAD for, for those clinical trials. So I think community advisory boards are one of the ways that a lot of studies do this to really engage in everything from that beginning conversation of how might this be interpreted, what are the concerns, how do we recruit, you know, what are the perceived risks, all those things. But I also think that that I mean, we, we're just about to submit, hit submit on a paper this week that I referred to as a, a conceptual model for maintaining, creating and maintaining openness to research. It said, if we think of this as a long-term relationship, so if I am recruiting Kim to be part of my study, then I am forming a relationship with Kim that begins at that first recruitment conversation that continues through informed consent that continues through the study, and that if we're really smart as researchers, I go back to Kim and other communities and I say, here's what we found. What do you think about what this means? And we've done this a lot. We did this a lot when we were in Pittsburgh, is have researchers come in to community settings and actually say, here are our results. And I've done it with, with studies of my own. And so I think it's a conversation that should start before the start of the research and continue afterwards. Uh, Wilma. I know. Oh. But I, <laughs> oh, all right. I have a sense of what your question is going to be, and I want to get it on the table early in the conversation. Just, I've, I've got a whole lot of, I got a whole lot of stuff to say. Um, and I'll try to be brief. So uh, with Dr. Goldkind, thank you so much. That was a, a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And I, and I agree with Kim's comment, and, and, and I appreciate your response to that. It's like, why didn't anyone ask? Anyway, and then uh, with Dr. Quinn, thank you so much uh, for your, yours. Um, one of the things that um, I wanted to ask is about the uh, African American and the Latino community. And I was wondering uh, if there was, uh, if you could uh, mention a little bit about uh, if there was any uh, looking into the issue of immigration. So for example, are this for, were they first generation, second generation? Uh, because that would lend some insight as to some of the responses and or reactions. And then for Dr. Schenker, I'm going to um, sh steal shamelessly and use your medical Miranda warning. Um, oh, OK. Well, um, all right, so I see. All right, because I'm wondering if the patient is hearing, you have the right to remain silent. You know, just a thought. And then 
Dr. Fernandez, man oh man, uh, I am just uh, wondering, based on what was presented regarding the inaccuracies of the conversions, what steps have been taken to remedy that, and if there has been any encouragement for the interpreters to look for certification at the national level through the National Board of Certification for Medical Interpreters or the Certification Commission for Healthcare Interpreters. There you go. So, uh, great, Dr. Quinn. Great question. I didn't realize there was going to be multiple parts. Yeah. So <laughs> That's if, you could be, if you could respond briefly, yeah. Yeah. we've got a lot of questions in a brief amount of time, so go ahead. Okay, mine's the easiest one. Um, yes, we actually are working on a paper right now where we look at, um, we actually, within the Latino sample, look at where people came from, whether they were born in the U.S., not born in the U.S., and so we're doing some of that analysis now. I'll just say that um, that phrase has also stuck with me, the medical Miranda warning, and I think we, um, you know, unfortunately convey that uh, uh, frequently uh, in our informed consent discussions, um, and a lot of that is around, I think, the, the who, when, uh, what, and how, um, and something that I'd like to, to work more on changing. Thank you for your question and for all your contributions um, in the field. Um, um, it, these were certified interpreters. These were outstanding interpreters. Interpretation is very difficult. So, and it's particularly difficult in something like end of life where many of the concepts may not be known. As you know, hospice, auspicio, and hospice mean totally different things. And one cannot be in, uh, uh, trans interpreted for the other. And so because of that, working with a group out of the California Healthcare Foundation and with CHIA, the uh, California uh, Health Interpreter Association, we created an online curriculum that is free, um, uh, that is especially for interpreters to uh, better their end of life conversations. Preliminary data shows that people like it and they learn and have more work. Well, a lot remains to be done. Okay, I'm going to come back to you, Lindsay. I want to go to Bernard. I'm going to work my way around. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask people brief questions and brief replies if we can. Yeah, so I have two brief questions, uh, one for Alicia and one for Yale. So for Alicia, I live, I live the results of your study, uh, your, your presentation. And, uh, uh, but my question to you is, we primarily use language, uh, telephone language lines rather than live interpreters. What do we know about the difference? And I have a lot of experience with that, some of it not so positive. What, but what do we know about the difference between using a telephone versus uh, uh, a, live, a live trained interpreter? And for Yale, I uh, completely agree with the need for time. Are there any interventions that show that you can really make, especially in an inpatient setting, uh, not a you know a research study uh, that you can really get people to actually take more time in the process of informed consent. Um, telephone interpreters are the least good of uh, of the interpreters, and one way in which technology is increasingly being harnessed is to have video interpretations, so that. Um, we, for example, have a bank of interpreters sitting in a building three blocks away, and yet we get the interpretation through a video machine that we just roll into the exam rooms and that we're now starting to use uh, throughout the hospital. In our new hospitals, will be on flat screen TV. There's no reason why I can't, why I, there's, there's no apparent reason why I shouldn't be able to Skype an interpreter sitting in China in order to get uh, video on my iPad at the bedside of a patient. So I think a lot of this has to do with um, uh, we need the private sector uh, to uh, step up, but the research is unequivocal that video or in person are both much better than telephone interpreters. Um, and I will say as far as the, the time piece, um, I think all of us who, who work in, in clinics um, and, and hospital settings know that, that time is of the essence. And I'm actually not uh, proposing uh, that we spend more time on the process. Rather, I think we need to sort of carefully think about the timing of the process and about ways, frankly, to, to um, maximize that time. You know, one example, you know, um, 
as physicians, we find ourselves frequently, particularly in primary care, saying the same thing over and over and over again. Are there ways, you know, that we can use technology to to help with that? Um, and also, I think using other members of the team, and we see this a lot in the hospital with surgeons sort of rushing in at the last minute from the operating room to quick consent the patient, you know, where there may be a member of the team who is much more present and able to do pieces of that uh, process. So it's not, nor do I know of uh, uh, ways to get physicians to spend spend more time, but rather sort of rethinking the time. Cindy, brief. Okay, I'm going to limit myself to one then. Um, Yale, you raised um, the issue that the treating clinician may not be the best person to present alternatives. So the surgeon knows the surgery, the oncologist knows the chemo, and, and for informed consent to truly be informed consent, they have to know what their choices are, including the choice of not having treatment. So I found the LVAD example very intriguing, where you mentioned that CMS requires a discussion with the palliative care clinician. So my question is, why would we think that the palliative care clinician is a good person to discuss alternatives except the alternative to not have treatment in the sense that um, uh, Diane Meyer wrote a really great Narrative Matters article in Health Affairs a few months ago. She's a palliative care clinician about um, how she um, was working with a patient who had cancer and who helped determine even when the oncologist kept offering treatment that the oncologist didn't think was going to be effective, how to disengage from that process. But particularly, I'm thinking about, you know, what can the government role, you know, here CMS is taking a stand saying you can't have this device unless you've had this conversation, and yet potentially accusations of death panels, and kind of, so who, how do we make sure that all those choices get on the table and who are the right people to talk about them? Easy question. Yeah. Um, um, so, you know, I, I was also fascinated by this requirement. It's something that we're seeing, you know, firsthand now as palliative care doctors because we are suddenly meeting a lot of these uh, patients uh, before uh, LVADs or, and, and some patients who are, who are for various reasons, not um, uh, deciding to proceed with, with the procedure or not, um, or, or not getting an LVAD. And I guess, you know, I would say, and I, I didn't um, mean to imply that we were somehow, you know, better qualified in palliative care. I think there is the perception, um, and, and I, you know, I think it's a misperception that in palliative care we're just sort of good at um, talking about not doing stuff. Um, I think, and from my sort of experience, you know, working as, as a palliative care physician, what we are, um, you know, good at is really um, taking a very patient-centered um, approach. Um, we spend a lot of time to the extent that time is important to, to elicit values, and we're very used to sort of weighing options. And my, you know, observing these discussions um, uh, by a clinician who sort of has an option that they provide, um, it's less about options and it's much more about risks um, and disclosure. Um, and so I think it's actually been very interesting to watch this evolve as a team process and to see how each of us can sort of bring something different um, to the table. Bernie. Yes, uh, Sarah covered this in her discussion, as did uh, most of the other panel members. This was, by the way, an excellent uh, panel. So can I opine that decreased understanding amongst research participants, whether it be language, whether it be education, whether it be anything we've discussed to date, extends to the researchers. And uh, that increased understanding amongst the participants cannot occur without the latter. So maybe we, we need to refocus our efforts a bit so the audience is a little different in, as we approach some of this. And it's not only the researchers, or not only the participants, but the researchers, whether they be clinical researchers or uh, surgical interventions or whatever, and change the culture in that attitude so that we have a better understanding of really what excellence is in uh, informed consent. We'll take that as a challenge. <laughs> okay, uh, Ruth. I love that, Bernie. Go get him. Um, so my question is, um, 
I appreciate that we have people who are focused on clinical research and we have people who are focused on medical treatment. And we're looking at informed consent across both domains and we started the first presentation with talking about how the process for informed consent is similar both in both in clinical research, drug discovery, drug development, whatever, and also in um, medical, around medical treatment. My question is whether or not, given that for what we're really focused on in some of the clinical research, particularly from the FDA lens, has to do with safety and efficacy. You're trying to understand safety and efficacy in order to bring to market and put it forward to the public. For medical decisions, medical treatment, we're really back to liberty and don't do anything to my body that I don't determine and the elements of that if we go with the framing where we started. Is the same process really going to work for both when you have outcomes that, that are related but not the same? Because we're, we're putting them all together and what we heard from a public perspective, except for Bernie who says let's go after the other side of it, but from a community patient-centered, you know, what I'm hearing is I want to hear my voice, I want to understand it, I want to be able to interpret it and know the language. But what are the real needs of the people who, who need that content in order to be able to give informed consent rather than us just, you know, obtain it? And whether or not the same process will work. And I, my question is, have any of you thought about that or do you know anybody else who has? I, I think your your questions very well um, is a, is an insightful one, and I actually think that there are some distinct differences between informed consent in the clinical setting and in the research setting. And I don't think it's so much what are the different components, the basic components of informed consent, the learning tasks that I described, but it's more so I think some of the assumptions that are made about the, um, the motivations, if you will, for lack of a better word, um, uh, the motivations behind the process. <clears throat> when clinicians are speaking to their patients about a treatment, the idea is, I'm trying to do something good for you. You are my center of focus. I want you to understand it should really be, going back to Bernie's comment, a, a mutual exchange trying to take the options. This is, you know, as a physician, uh, physician who does clinical ethics, I really think that it ought to be about taking the medical options and putting it in within that patient's value system and their medical needs, their life context. But the idea is it's patient-centered. When you're doing informed consent in a research context, it is, it, it always, I mean, I don't, I, I, I always say that informed consent is a protection that is downstream, that we should never get to informed consent if we don't think as a, as a research community, as a researcher, investigator, as an IRB, that the research holds out, has the right risk benefit ratio <clears throat> and that the scientific questions that are being asked are critically important and that they can be addressed by the research design. So once that's all in place, the re there's still the idea that this research is not is protocol driven. The interventions are not necessarily for the treatment of that individual patient, but to generate scientific knowledge. And that, that shift that where obviously I'm not saying that the research subject's well-being is not important. I don't mean that at all. But that shift is, changes in my mind the parity between clinical informed consent and informed consent obtained in the research context. Any responses to that? You guys all good with that? Um, Michael. Thank you very much, and I think that was a great presentation uh, by all of you. I'm really fascinated by the kind of the intersection of um, uh, those populations that are facing health disparities, uh, language barriers, limited English proficiency, uh, 
and some of the uh, elements that we try to uh, address uh, as uh, the healthcare system. Um, and I guess my question has to do with whether there has been any research you're aware of, any uh, anecdotal uh, kinds of uh, 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 stories or observations that you could share with respect to where some of these populations <clears throat> place value themselves on the informed consent process as a, as a concept. Where I work, we work for a, a health, I run a healthcare nonprofit, and one of the things that we're very uh, involved in right now is uh, um, signing up people for health insurance who have never had health insurance. Uh, the complex, so I'm looking at this issue kind of through the lens of the complexity of the system, kind of the basis of health literacy, the complexity of the system, uh, and the demand that we put on versus people's capacity and ability to understand that. So, uh, you know, for a lot of people, it's like, I have health insurance. I can actually get treatment, and I just want to get the treatment. Uh, it seems to me that health, uh, informed consent may be kind of a drilling down a little bit uh, in, into that process, and some people may just decide, I trust the clinician. I just want to get the care. I don't necessarily want to be faced with a lot of choices have to digest a lot of information. That's another barrier that I need to uh, sort of work my way through. I'm just happy that I get coverage and treatment and I just, I trust you guys. And especially, I mean, there's certain, uh, you know, perhaps first generation, um, uh, you know, immigrant, older population, those sorts of things. Is there any uh, uh, anecdotal stories, evidence, research that you've uh, encountered that talks about that little bit of a disconnect with what we're asking for in these requirements, we have these choices we're putting in front of people and their desire to really even participate in that. So, so there's actually, um, so first, th 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 thank you for your question. And it uh, really gets at the heart of what are some of the issues. Um, it, there, there actually is some research on this and about 20, it, and, and about uh, 20 to 30 percent of people getting larger as, as, as you look at more vulnerable groups and as older patients say, I don't want the sort of consumerist model of shared decision making. I want my doctor to decide. And over and over again, I have patients who say, when I try to present them with an option, you choose. You, I, I trust you. You choose. What, hap what happens? And and so and I think that that is completely valid and 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 should absolutely be respected uh, when when people should get to choose not to not to not to uh, uh, persist in that consumerist model. What happens, however, when the trust is broken? Uh, some of, many of you are probably familiar that three years ago, uh, the, the same researcher, uh, a researcher looking at Tuskegee, broke the story of the in, uh, of the Guatemalan experiments uh, with syphilis, where by which people were intentionally infected with syphilis, uh, uh, leading uh, then uh, Secretary of State Clinton to issue uh, an apology uh, to Guatemala. That story, most of my residents don't know it. They missed the times that day, met the, made the cover. Uh, however, most of my patients who cannot, many of whom cannot read, know that story. Um, and so what happens when there is no trust or when there isn't a trusted care relationship or when the patient is sick and the doctor says chemotherapy or no chemotherapy? So this is very complicated and cannot be fixed by a form, and there are many, many forces at work. However, there are things that we can do, I think, that would, 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 would move us forward. Andrew, and then Lindsay, and then we're up. You got yours? OK. Andrew, and then I've got a question, and we're going to have lunch after that. Good. Then I'm not between people and lunch. I can blame you, George. <laughs> um, uh, just <laughs> exactly. Uh, you still are, Andrew. It's just. <laughs> Longer. Then I'll take my time. Um, no, but very quickly, I, I might have misunderstood a comment at the end there, but I think it's worth saying out loud that uh, the provision of language access is already a legal requirement for institutions that receive federal funds. That's under both the Civil Rights Act and an executive order, so okay. it's not. Um, and this builds on my actual question, which starts how the panel started. I think it was Dr. Col Gold kind who said that it's not the existing regulations that's the problem, it's the application and interpretation of those to which someone as a community researcher, which is almost completely missing from this discussion, by the way, I work with multiple IRBs across the country, and I can tell you that they all apply the existing regulations very differently um, across the board. But what I would ask is, because what I'm hearing is an argument that uh, tailoring or um, situational approaches to the process are 
missing and very necessary, could not the regulations go further and require that tailoring, which is the best practice of health literacy? And if so, what would those regs look like, both to you and the speakers um, through the rest of the day? <laughs> well, I, I, would, I don't want to uh, shortchange that question, because I think it's a good one. But I, I will give you just this thinking. Um, and this, be careful what you ask for, in the sense that when you have regulations that you now need to apply uniformly, you lose the ability to have some flexibility um, on, in different cases. Regulations just can't be granular enough to cover all the nuances of different co contexts and study populations and, and scenarios. And we've already talked about how all research is not created equal and that a minimal risk survey study is really different than a first in human stem cell transplant that might continue lifelong. And so the kind of, of, comp, of informed consent that we think might be suitable or even though the regulations have very clearly stated it must be in the language understandable, you cannot have conflict of interest or undue influence, and here's what you should disclose. While that might help you with all of those different scenarios, if you start layering additional requirements on top of those, then it becomes harder and harder to do, um, to make the types of changes that let's say the literature might demonstrate or empiric studies might demonstrate would be best for one context or another. So I just, I caution us in trying to fix the informed consent quagmire with additional regulations. I think that the more that we do empiric research, the more conversations we have with study groups where we learn what's needed by them, we can make certain adjustments that um, are complementary to the regulations that already exist. Now, it is quite possible that as we do this empiric research, we will then see that we want to make certain changes in the regulations. But the regulations are not a, um, they're not easily changed. So once you have them on the books, they don't adjust quick, they don't adjust in a time sensitive manner. Um, there's a, a lot that has to go into making changes to regulations. So I think having a broader set of regulations is, um, is, is, is advantageous. And then you can always, they create the floor. You can always add additional protections superimposed on those as necessary for a given circumstance. And I, I can see that you're a little skeptical about my answer, so maybe we can talk more after we finish the time-limited presentation. So let me offer an alternative. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, let me just take the, let me just take an, uh, the opposite point of view. <laughs> uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, that there are areas where more regulation may be uh, beneficial, um, and uh, um, and not uh, not to uh, to the fine print, but to the broad print. For example, the, uh, Washington State ha uh, regulates what needs to be included in informed cons consent. Other states do not. There's a there's a there's a, an empiric question, uh, something waiting to be answered. Um, do people in Washington State for the same procedures have better understanding than the people in Western Massachusetts? I haven't seen any data, but I would, but I suspect they do. But we don't know. Let's answer that question. The second second question is, most states, as you know, as you say, language access is a federal requirement. Having a having an interpreter. Um, uh, consent you before someone cuts off your leg is actually not a requirement. Um, it is a requirement in case law, um, uh, but it is actually not a requirement. Uh, JCO uh, uh, is moving to uh, start those things, but they need to be uh, uh, required and, uh, and they need to be uh, audited. Um, 
So that's, I, but your point, your larger point is well taken. Well, I'm, I'm just talking very basic uh, uh, requirements. So uh, let me conclude with uh, this observation question. Um, so um, regulation pro and con, okay. So we've got, uh, you know, t as a solution to this tailoring uh, issue. But I'm, I think this panel has been particularly useful, for me anyway, in raising a number of issues, and, and I, I really appreciate it. So let me first thank you all for just an excellent job. Um, but the question that occurred to me over the course of this panel was that um, to the extent we framed the question, and we framed it since we're having this workshop on informed consent, at the end of a chain where you've got a procedure, the process has to happen, and so forth, you're pushing your, you're pushing your opportunities way downstream. So I've been, I've been thinking about it, particularly with uh, this framework uh, that was laid out in terms of the where, who, where, when, what, how kind of, uh, of this as to whether or not we should be upstream, really going to patients and starting with patients rather than procedures or research or treatment, and thinking about what are the categories of information that we ought to be paying attention to. What are the questions? So life or death, function, consequences of, 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 of the intervention, likelihood of success, uh, potential impact on, uh, of research, uh, is it a worthwhile study or is it a trivial study? Is it a big question? Is it a little question? Is it a, you know, is it a early sort of calibration sort of issue or not? Does that make a difference to whether people want to step forward and volunteer or not? Um, the concept of uh, impact on activities of daily living, what are the potential there? Impact, impact on activities related to career or family or self-functioning, um, you know, um, is it consistent with culture and values, which has come up? Uh, uh, those kinds of, maybe that's not a complete sort of list, but it seems to me we ought to be thinking about starting with patients and then looking at the cascade of opportunities right on through to advanced planning to, uh, 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 you know, informed decision making down to informed consent as, as a way of, of framing this. Any reactions to that? I'll react, and, and I um, I agree. I think um, that's a very patient-centered um, view, and unfortunately, I think not what we typically see um, when we're talking about, and I'll stick to the clinical uh, setting here, because I do think we need to sort of separate the two um, with this kind of framework. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. I think, you know, the requirements and the sort of, you know, the, the ethical goals of informed consent uh, uh, really grew out of, of a desire to to um, involve and protect patients. Unfortunately, I think the way the process has sort of been operationalized uh, for many procedures um, in many different clinical settings, that's not what happened. So the extent that we can sort of rethink that um, and expand perhaps uh, beyond informed consent to informed choice or whatever language we sort of decide uh, to choose, um, I think is valuable. Uh, this has been out, uh, an excellent panel. I really appreciate it uh, personally, and I, I think from the nature of the questions, I think you've engaged the audience. So please join me in thanking this panel.